Well, guys, welcome back to another bee chat. I'm filling in for E tonight. Hope everyone's enjoying their bee yards and the uh, change in pace. And uh, hope everyone's doing well. Don, what's going on down in your bee yards and, and what are we talking about tonight? Well, I uh, posted a couple pictures. We are expanding. We are going a little bit bigger time. Uh, we're going to be selling syrup pretty soon. I mean, we're, we're gearing up to, to really run some packages next year. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is one of the easiest, simplest ways to make splits. I mean, you can't get any easier. I got a whole bunch of queen cells. And they're going to hatch either tomorrow or Monday. So what we do when we want to make 50 or 100 splits, we take a frame of honey, we put it in a five-frame box, just a frame of honey and two frames with starter strips. That way there's no brood there. And you take the original hive and you move it to a different stand. And you do it after 1 o'clock. So you can move 50 of them. And if you lost half of them, I mean, you've got 25 splits and you haven't even have opened your box up. That's the beauty part of it. You can work naked out there or with shorts and there's no excuse you can't get uh, splits out of this. We've been doing it for years and I keep telling people easier and easier ways and most people think that ain't gonna work because it's just too simple. But it's just like when we sell our nukes. We don't sell nukes until one o'clock and from one to five. And when we sell that nuke, we sell five frames out of that box. So we got field bees coming. And when your customer leaves, we walk in and put another frame of honey there to catch our field bees. And as soon as we got time, we drop a ripe cell in there. Or if you don't have ripe cells, you can cut a cell from your own hives. Usually a five frame hive, you can get anywhere from 10 to 30 cells in there and keep them going in your bee yard but it's the absolute easiest way. The next way to make splits is right now, temperatures is hot. So everybody says, my bees are bearding. Take a frame of honey, put it in a five frame box, take a milk jug, cut the bottom up, leave the lid on it, walk up to that beard and just scoop off a, a cupful or two cups, whatever's hanging in that beard. Sometimes you get about three cups. Drop it in that five frame split you just made or set it off to the side and dump those bees in there and put a queen cell. It's so it's so simple. I mean, you're not risking nothing. And the risk for getting high beetles is very low because high beetles are not going to reproduce unless you've got pollen in there. And that's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of backyard beekeepers make. They throw brood in there. They throw pollen in there. They throw a whole bunch of honey in there. And then they don't put enough bees, and then pretty soon, the beetles start eating them up real quick. The simplest ways to make these splits work, believe me. So, yeah, I hope someone's got some questions tonight on making splits. I keep giving you different ways to make splits. There's no reason you can't make splits all the way up into October, no matter where you live. You don't have to depend on the honey flow. You have a honey flow with a handle on it. You just pour it in a hive and it's got a honey flow going. So who's got the first good questions? Let's see. Uh... Go ahead, Mark. Mark Patino. Hey, Don. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Hey, uh, so I watched your video on sending the bees down the drain. Yeah, I, I, just want, I just want to make, I want to make sure I understand that that helps speed it up because you don't have to, you're, you're shaking the bees and you're, you're not looking for the queen on every frame, right? Is that the purpose well, of putting the bees? It's basically an insurance policy. We go through hives so quick, we give it a glance. If that queen don't stand out and catch her in the first frame or two, time is money. Shake the bees in there and let them go down the drain. Uh, you can spot the queen real easy. Now, if you're slow and you're not able to spot the queen, one good thing to do is put a five-frame box there when you're making your split and then take an eight-frame lid and line the holes up. And one trick to do is get a golf ball, stick it in that hole, 
shake those beads in and give them about 30 seconds. They'll settle right down and they'll locate that queen for you. They usually start making a circle right around her. That's the easiest way, but you know, you have to work at your own speed. I keep coming up with these little shortcuts okay. and it confuses a lot of people. But if I if I spot the queen right away, then there's no point in me having to do that, right? Well, if you spot the queen right away, you don't need to do it. No, the only way I the reason okay. I do it, okay, and then what I'm trying to do is put the field bees into the air and get them to go back to the parent hive. All I want is nurse bees. Okay. Okay, so then that was my next question. If I find the let's say I just I know where the queen is. And I'm going to split a honey frame and a, a frame of brood into the split. Um, you don't need so a frame of brood. So I just take those frames. No, I don't need a frame of brood. Okay, so I just put the honey in the, the bees the bees that are on the honey. I don't need to shake anything then, right? Or I still take them off. You need a ripe queen cell. Right. Or right. A, a, if a I queen. press the queen, I must. Okay, if I have. I think we just lost them. Yep, I, th I think we lost them there. If you uh, get back online, ch check back in. We'll get that uh, that question answered. Uh, let's see, David T. Go ahead, buddy. Uh, yeah, Don, I've been doing some splits, and the queen comes back, and a week later, I'll see that she lays maybe about a a hand size uh, thing of brood, and then I'll come back a few days later, and the queen's gone. Uh, is was am I doing something wrong, or is there something she didn't get uh, made it good, or, or what? What do you think maybe be going on? The bees are there. It's just the queen is just left. Well, did she come back and lay enough that she stays, or or are you feeding them? There's, there could be a lot of things. Do you have your box well ventilated? Yeah, I've got my ventilation holes in it. Uh, I always put. Uh, some uh, feed on top of it. Uh, it. It seemed like she just lays maybe like a, a, a size of the palm of your hand, and they'll go to cap it and everything, and it's just like she's gone. Uh, I don't know if she didn't. I don't mean. Do I ain't having no high beetles. You know like your hives. Do what? Do you have a lot of drones in all your hives? Uh, right now, I think I'm getting kind of low on drones. I did go ahead and buy some of them uh, green, uh, green frames, you know. Yeah, yeah to, uh, to put that some would of them be behind. The next thing I would suggest would be, you know, because if you got a queen that comes back and they lay very little and then they disappear, they're going out and uh, they're remating, and then okay. you run that risk all the time. You've got dragonflies, you know, June, July, August, uh, they could be. Yeah. Pretty the best thing to do is saturate your area with a lot of drones and different hives. Okay. All right, then. That, that may be the case, then, because I've been doing a whole lot of splits this summer, and uh, I just now got my green comb in because they was on back order, so uh, I'll probably wait till I get some more drones to hatch out, and then I'll try some more splits again. Yeah. I right, appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Paul, you're up, buddy. Go ahead. Can you un unmute yourself? There you go. All right. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> um, Don, I have a question. Yeah. Tell me about it. Um, I have a question. If if you're running, like, I didn't reverse my super and my uh, brood chamber. I'm I'm Right now I have a 10-frame a deep and, and a 10-frame medium, and then I have my queen excluder above that because my queen moved up in the spring, and I didn't get a chance to... Um, to reverse them but can i do i have to look for the queen or can i split the um the deep and the medium make that into two separate hives and then come back in a week or two and look where the queen is in, which which box the queen is in well you can, can you do that, like that you can set the medium on a bottom board and then put a lid over each one i've done a video on doing about seven or eight five frame uh, splits out of one eight frame all you have to do is put the lid over the box and wait 30 seconds to a minute. Lift the lid up really slow. The quiet one's where your queen's at. All right. Yeah, I forgot about that. You always talk about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> at one time. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll give that a shot. But I wouldn't be so. using a queen excluder. I mean, if you're trying to no, make no. Money, 
you know, just put yeah. your boxes on. Yep. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. Okay, Mark. Looks like Mark's back. Mark, did you uh, want to finish up your question there? Let's see, I tell you what, Mark, if you'll uh, just message me your question, we'll be sure to get that to Don there. I think we're uh, losing your connection there. Okay, I think uh, Mark was talking about going down the drain there, Don, and there's mm -hmm. the, the more, since you taught, taught us that trick, uh, it seems like the opportunities are endless for that. Uh, today, I was in the bee yard working the, where we mate the queens at in our little mating boxes. And, you know, after so many times of getting queens out of those boxes, you have to recharge those boxes. And I think I've, that's probably the most, one of my favorite ways to use the going down the drain is, like you said there, you can keep the brood uh, out of those boxes when you're putting the new cells in by just going through whatever hive is heavy, go to those resource size and just shake off those brood frames. And like you said, the foragers fly back, everybody else goes down the drain, and with very little effort, your box is restocked and ready for another queen cell. Right. That sure is a heck of a lot easier than digging through boxes, finding frames, moving frames, you know, putting another frame back in the box you robbed it from, and that dance back and forth, back and forth. Just shaking those rascals right off uh, has been really helpful. So there's probably a million different ways you can use that going down the drain trick. Well, there's, there's so many things that I've done, experimented with, and come up with over the years. Uh, the biggest thing that I have problems with, and a lot of beekeepers do, once they get over 25 hives, it's hard to keep up mentally what's going on. You pull a frame from this hive, I got good intentions, I'm going to go back and put that frame back. And then you're off doing five more splits, and then another five, then another five. Then you're hot, you're tired, you go in a house, you forget. Two days later, oh, I forgot a frame. You go out there, you pull the lid, here's all that comb hanging there. It's amazing how that happens, but you've got to have a system. So there's a lot of these little systems I've come up with. Scooping bees off of a beard and putting them in a hive is one of the easiest ways. And as long as you've got queen cells or mated queens, I mean, you got a hive out there, it'll beard out good in the afternoon. You can scoop it off, close the entrance up with a, a piece of hardware cloth, put that queen cell in there, and I can guarantee you go back to that same hive the next day and you can scoop another scoop off. These bees are multiplying at least 5,000 bees hatching out a day. So after 24 hours, 36 hours, the ones that you had screened off, open it up, let those old field bees go back. The majority of them is going to stay right there with that queen cell. So people... Don't, they don't want to make a chance to lose that honey flow. They don't understand that boxes stack five high. If you go through there, make paint them that five high and make 25 splits. If you lost half of them, you got 12 hives producing honey more than that one hive, and it's borderline swarming all the time. Because in order to get it that high, you've got mass amount of bees. And when you reach a certain threshold, they want to swarm. And you can go through those boxes, sure, and check for queen cells. But when you get 25 or more hives, it'll wear you out lifting them boxes. I know it does me. I could do it when I was younger, but I'm getting old now. Them boxes get awful heavy during the day. I think that the uh, going down the drain uh, trick has pretty much, you know, maybe three years ago or four years ago when I was working with you down there, before that, you would just take uh, anything, a, uh, a scrap hive lid, and you had the trick where you'd lean it on the front of the hive and shake bees onto that, or put a box up and have, have that lid parallel with the entrance. Mm -hmm. uh, so if folks remember and have used those tricks before, it's pretty much the same exact thing, only you have a hole in the lid right over the hive, and you can just literally shake them and run and go on to the next box without setting booby traps up. Mm -hmm. Also, you don't have to bend over. And if you're in the yeah. hot sun and you bend over, you know, or get down on your knees looking for a queen, after three or four hives, it gets old. It gets tiresome. So 
I keep taking something and keep refining it to where it's easier and easier. The old ways still work. Sometimes I do a lot of the old ways. I mean, as long as you're making bees, it's successful. Okay, guys, uh, either go ahead and text your questions in or go ahead and put your hand up and we'll, uh, we'll get you covered. Uh, in the meantime, Don, what's, what's the, your hardest time of the year uh, to make splits? I know you can just get about what, you know, just about get away with it any time of the year for the most part down there. You have a couple months, that's maybe a little rough. What's, what's your biggest challenge for you, for the fat bee man, uh, to make bees? What does that look like? I uh, think probably late July through August, about the third week in August. I think those months, the heat alone is the, is the worst enemy. And then the shortage of bees. I mean, there's people that's been to my new yard, been up here, and they say, how can you have a shortage of bees? In all the years that I've been selling bees, I have not yet come out into fall with more bees than I could sell. I never have enough. And right now I'm already shopping, trying to find someone can furnish a bunch of packages for me in springtime because we're expanding out three and 400 splits a week to every 10 days. So you got to build yards up to have numbers to shake three to 500 packages two or three times a week. I mean, there's no way you can get ahead of this game and people will call you, send you an email. I want to get into commercial beekeeping. I want to sell bees, but I don't think I can sell bees. And right now, I keep telling people, you could put yellow jackets in a box and people will buy them. <laughs> There's such a shortage of bees now. You can sell anything you get your hands on. You'll never make enough bees. But if you're going to get into this business, my advice is try to build your stock at least the first year. Because once you start selling, you never get ahead. The second year is rough if you're selling, you know, right down to your minimal. That, so you that seems to be the reoccurring thing. It's hard to explain that to a person. Well, I think a lot of folks who have been listening to you and are growing their yards and are selling nukes and queens, that's where most of us are. We've, we're, we're stretched thin on resources uh, because a lot of us have a hard time saying no. You know, we don't want to turn that sale down and make those relationships and keep growing, but... You know, a lot of us like right now, uh, especially in the Midwest, we're at a, at a point where if we did well in the spring, you know, a lot of our resource hives are stretched pretty thin where we, you know, might be on a little bit of a cruise control until they get built back up to have enough to risk again. Because, you know, if you've got, if you have two or 300 hives, you know, you've got a little bit of flexibility, but if you're down to 50 to 100 hives uh, and you need to be right there again at 100 hives going into the wintertime, you have less uh, resources that you can risk to meet the goals for next year. So it seems like not only are we thinking about getting the next rounds of Queens mated and a couple more rounds of nukes out for this year, we're thinking about next year. Uh, and that's, that's the, that seems to be the trickiest part is finding the balance of having enough resource hives to pull from without getting yourself stretched too thin to where you absolutely have to say no, because you just don't have the bees to do it until they get caught up. That seems to be where a lot of us are. It's a fine line. <laughs> okay, uh, Brett, go ahead, Brett. Hey, everybody. Um, one quick question on mating nukes, the small um, entrance hole, what mm -hmm. size is it? Uh, depends on if you're up north or you're down south. Down here, I started with half inch. And we're running basically three quarters or seven eighths right now. And we put one hole in the front and one in the back with a screen over it. Yep. Now, up north, you probably get by with a half inch hole and maybe not a vent hole. But I think over the years, I've learned that a vent hole in a small box works a lot better. Thank Some you. people, they got a brand new box of fancy boxes, and they're very reluctant to start cutting holes in them. <laughs> but I would rather have a hole with healthy bees or a, a hive with holes in the front and back and healthy than have a beautiful hive sitting there and the bees got hot and died. So you've got to have enough ventilation in those hives. Thank you. Okay, you're going to get into making nukes now, huh? 
Oh, I've been grafting like crazy. Just lost uh, 57 queens because a swarm went in and the queen killed all the cells. <laughs> well, you notice when you was down, you notice we got a lot of cell builders to put cells in. Yep. I mean, right now we're running almost 50 cell builders. Whoa. That way we can run, each of those cell builders got uh, 100 cells in them. So if we do have a queen flies out, and then another thing is keep your mating yard uh, kind of away from your cell builders. Keep mostly queen right hives in your area where your cell builders are. It was actually a swarm from a neighbor about a mile away. Mm -hmm. The only reason why I know it's his is because he marks his queens with a pink dot. You gave it back yeah. to him, didn't you? No. <laughs> no, I told him he was a bonehead for not checking his hives. But Well, you know, I've had people ask me how you keep the bees in there. Uh, people will try to put a queen excluder on your bottom board, then put your hives on. Uh, we did that one year, probably 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the problem you have with that is even workers, if they die in the hive, the bees struggle to pull them through that queen excluder. Mm -hmm. And if you got drones in there, I mean, you know, pretty soon your entrance is clogged up or your, your queen excluder. So that's the, the whole thing about raising queens. There's all these little tricks and, and gizmos you have to do, and everything is unique about it. If it was so simple, Every beekeeper would make all their own queens and, and they'll have no problem. So, you know, but it's trial and error. That's all it is. That's it. I'm glad to see that that lesson that you took for grafting queens must have paid off. Oh, yeah. I'm getting uh, 90 to 95% every time. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, Don, I guess it's everyone's having a birthday today. They're usually on here, but uh, Maureen Higdon, uh, Eric's wife, she's usually on here. It's her birthday. Happy birthday, Maureen. And it's also Victor Sandschafer's birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday Victor. I'm sure they'll be listening back. Uh, Paul, looks like I got your hand up there. Go ahead, Paul. So that, that, um, what do you call it? Shake and then down the drain, or Put them down the drain. I, I don't quite, I don't quite understand that. I mean, I, I'm running. I have five double nukes. They're four frame double nukes with the divider down the center, and mm -hmm. I would like to split them, but I don't want to dig through them and look for my queen because, I mean, those hives are packed full. So can I just, you know, take frames, and and like you said, Don, just you know. Make sure I got eggs in both hives and just let them produce a queen. Well, it would be a whole lot easier to go to a hive and set you up a five frame nuke next to that box, put a frame of honey in there, put your lid on, put maybe two frames in there with starter strips on each side, put a queen cell in there, put the lid on. Now you got holes in your lid? Yeah. Okay, if you got a hole in your lid, then take an eight frame or a 10 frame lid and turn it upside down on top of that lid. So you got two lids, one the right way, one upside down. Make sure your holes are lined up. Now, if you got a double box there, you need to get something to uh, cover up one side of that double nuke. Take one frame at a time, take it over that nuke and shake it into it. Shake it into that lid. If you think you're gonna miss the queen, put a golf ball in the hole. After you get all them frames shook, then close the hive up. That Shake the frame, put the frame back in the hive, close it up. And then when you spot the queen, pick her up, put her inside the spelons in. And the rest of the bees are going to go down the drain. All right, yep, now I get you. Pretty easy okay. to do that way. Yep, yep. All right, thanks. Okay. Okay, Mr. Crutchfield, I wondered if you might have an update on your beekeeping season so far. Get on mute. You have to unmute yourself there. All right, how are you here now? There, there you go. go. Doing pretty good. I've shut it down the sales for now, trying to recoup and get ready for. <laughs> <laughs> Stretch the <laughs> <laughs> 
I uh, not, uh, not done too bad. The last few weeks, um, real good. Everything's looking good. We're running about 100 degree weather right now, so I got to keep an eye on them. They're bearding up real heavy and trying to get them ventilated, but I can't complain. Sales are already lining up for next year. So, doing good, doing good. But I can sell every one of them if I wanted to, but I've got to stop. It's hard to stop. <laughs> well, we're going to stop. I've turned them down today. I said, I got to build my own base up. I got to get uh, another couple hundred hives resources. My resources are slim. And uh, well, you're telling me when you first started, you had 150 yeah. nukes ready to go. You're a set, you said. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm set, all right. Now, we're still building nukes. We're buying nukes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to get some full-size hives to pull from, so I'm letting them grow out, feeding them, making sure for next year mm -hmm. we'll have some. And hopefully, we'll pick up some more packages and build it up quicker. But, yeah. no, it's it's been a pretty good year this year. Mm -hmm. uh, no mites, no beetles. Wait for next year. That'll, think, that'll change all that. No one up here is having any problem with the beetles right now. I thought it was just me, and I was glad, but everybody's having no problems so they're cycled out maybe next year they'll hit us again the main thing is keep your your hive numbers up and know about where that borderline is because once you get below that line there it seems that you'll have more of a beetle problem yeah. uh, if you can get out there and work those hives that simple change out them hives just change the box out and do that you know every two weeks and you're in good shape that way because what you can't see, they'll be in the corner. You can squash those beetles and keep it under control. Well, I go through them pretty regular just for that reason. I found two beetles so far, mm -hmm. but I put that greenhouse mat under all the rows. And if they do hatch a larva, it hits that mat, burns them up. So haven't treated, hadn't put anything in. So, so far, so good. But yep, that's good. I've lost a bunch before with it, so I'm keeping my eyes on it. You've got to keep an eye on it. That's all you can do lost one swarm and I went through the hive. I must have, must have missed the cell, but it landed close enough and I picked my own swarm up. And then I gathered one from somebody else. <laughs> so not too bad, but uh, no, I can't complain. It's going well. Just got to get the resources up to where I can really make some sales. Yeah. But other than that. How high can you go with your thing to catch swarms? I've got a 40 foot pole with a bucket tape to it. I can reach up high in the tree. Uh, <laughs> I've was, was going to give a suggestion of what I do. I got cement finishing poles, which is about almost eight foot and they screw in They're aluminum. Mm -hmm. And I can put uh, seven poles together, but personally, and my students will tell you, I do three poles. If there's no one else, three poles with a two gallon bucket taped to the end of that pole, and at a 30 degree or 45 degrees, you think you've got a, a 100 pound box of sand or something up there. It, it'll pull your muscle. It does it that. <laughs> so, yeah, I have to hold it back because it wants to come right on down. But so far, I hadn't had to reach that far this year. So it's been pretty good. People's been using two by fours and two by twos nailed together, but Usually, once you get over 12, 14 foot, it gets heavy with the wood, and then they seem to bust. So yeah. that's why I thought I'd mention those aluminum poles. They're a little pricey, but you catch a swarm or two and it pays for them. Well, I had a painter gave me a bunch of his painting stuff, and one of them was in poles. And yeah, it's the best thing I ever had. I can reach up and get them pretty easy. So. But, the best buckets to get is the ones like you get from like Walmart, the older ones that have that metal handle. The yeah. plastic ones don't do well at all. They sit out in the sun and about a week they crack on you. Yeah. Yep, I agree with that. Yep. How hot is it down there? Yeah, well, I was down my southern bee yard today and it was 97. And when I got ready to leave, it hit 98. But I, I stayed down there on the weekends and... I have to work for about an hour, 45 minutes, and I got a trailer down. I got air conditioning, go in there and cool off, have a glass of water, and go back out and do a little bit more, and then go back and cool off again. Oh, we step outside and you immediately start to sweat. It's uh, it's humid here, but um, I just work and go inside and cool off. And yep. Mm -hmm. That's all I can do. As long as I'm on a regular schedule, I'm crowded. My 10, I'm going, I've shortened my time. I go in the hive. So if I miss a day or if I'm running a little slow, yeah. 
I'm all right, but uh, get too old for this 100 degree temperature. <laughs> but you know, if you can stay in beekeeping, you can't say you're getting too old. You see, I'm 78 years old, and I was still running a finishing machine in that slab I poured down there. <laughs> We're getting ready to do that. Yeah, Putting I, a off-grid house up here. That to anybody. It's just, I didn't do concrete for a while. I still had all my concrete stuff here, but I'll tell you what, I felt it. If you don't do it on a regular basis, just finishing machine will wear you out. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> but we're doing all right. Yeah, I good. appreciate the, appreciate all the help. Yeah. Um, there's, they're finally catching on. They're getting on your website. They're seeing my name. They're calling and um, meet some good people. So a lot of return customers. So I can't complain. That's what we want to hear. Okay, good deal. Thanks, Dennis. Mr. Robbie, you're up. Go ahead, buddy. You have to unmute yourself there if you can. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. I got my new headphones on. Okay. Um, last week, I got my my queen bee for my honeybees. Um, they phoned on me a while back. I did not want to leave hot, my hive. Plus, I have my neighbor has his own set of honeybees. I gave him my nuke box, and I'm gonna go back over to his house in a couple of days from now and split his hive. That helps me and helps him too for this time of year. My question is, after I put my queen bee in my box, how soon should I be seen on food? I put her in on Thursday of last week. Thursday of last week? I think, yes. you know, if you're not really experienced, I try to tell people, wait at least 10 days, 12 days, then go in it. Because mm -hmm. by then you should have eggs. And if you're wearing a veil and wear gloves, if you bump that queen and she hasn't started to lay, you're back to zero again, so. Uh, you can take and lift the lid off, and if they're pretty quiet, I wouldn't worry about it. Did you pull the queen cage out about three to four days after you put the queen in? Yes. The queen cage, the candy was eaten about halfway. She had way to escape on, it, on both sides. The screen, the metal screen, was not damaged. That's a good thing, right? I was checking that to see if there's any evidence of them trying to kill the queen while she was in the cage. No proof of that. So that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I let Nate take his course, right? Yep. Yep. All I would right. wait a few more days and then I'd go in there. You know, you can pull a frame out and check. Now the easiest uh, way to check if you're looking through a veil is to stand by the hive put your back facing the sun so when the sun comes across your shoulder it'll go into the frames and then you can look into the cells you should see looks like a little bit of white milk in the bottom of the cell that tells you mm -hmm. you've got a queen in your laying all right um second question almost a month ago i made me um um uh, open feed pretty thick Mix it up real good. Um, I think I, I might be seeing my honeybees around it. I don't see bees around it. I'm guessing I have heavy nectar flow right yeah, now, I guess. Yeah, probably do. Yep. Okay. So I guess I could see if I have nectar flow or not by looking at that, some, that um, open feed. Okay. So I got keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> yep. Sound like you're in good shape. All right, I'll give you guys updates and pictures when I okay. have good pictures to, to give you guys. Okay, appreciate it. Um, all right. Thanks, Robbie. Mr. Ernest, I wonder maybe if you give us an update on uh, your bee yard there in Pennsylvania. You have to unmute yourself there if you can. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, right, uh, just hot weather. I'm not getting too much done. Uh, I'm getting headaches. Uh, I don't think I can take the heat too well. Uh, 
So I'm kind of like Don. I got to work a little bit and jump back in the truck and cool off. And but uh, I've made up uh, several nukes and uh, got my new AI Queen uh, cells in them. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm doing pretty good, I guess. But uh, I'd like to do more, but uh, with the heat, I just can't uh, can't seem. To, I go out there like six o'clock in the morning and. Uh, try to do a little bit of work. I went out tonight and took off uh, uh, some queen cells I had that's ready to come off. So I did that about 5.30, so uh, not too much, not too much happening. Uh, just a lot of work right now, you know, keeping them fed up and uh, and uh, making sure that they're not uh, overheating too much. I got a hose over in my yard uh, so I got water running. It's on a timer. It, uh, it runs during the day, so uh, they don't have to go too far to get water. So, but uh, been doing some outside feeding too. Uh, I'm surprised how quick they'll take it. I put two and a half gallon bucket in a tote with straw in it, and they'll take that down in less than two hours. Maybe you got some local beekeepers you're feeding too. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm feeding John's bees. <laughs> but it's better to do that than to have them being robbing, you know, going robbing all the time. So I'd rather give them a little something to do. But I don't know how much they'd eat if I kept putting it out there the whole day long. They'll eat all you can give them. They usually, though, if you've got a pretty good honey flow, they, they won't touch open feeding. I know, but there's no honey flow. It's, we're in the dirt right now. So it's nothing coming in. Then it was dry for a while, and the clover dried up, and now mm -hmm. we had some rain again. So goldenrod should be coming in another two or three weeks. Yeah, yeah, we got a, another two or three weeks. But uh, I was thinking about stopping grafting for a while uh, during the last of July and August. Do you stop or do you keep on grafting, Don? Uh, I got my incubator out there in the garage right now, and it's probably got 200 cells in it. <laughs> yeah. Do you get a good return on them or this time of year? Uh, yeah, well, you mean for grafting or for the returns of the queens? A return for the queen. Yeah, we, we do pretty good right now. We're probably doing 85% uh, maybe, a little more. Yeah. Just depends which yard, you know. We got several yards that we use for mating yards, and one yard will sometimes do a little better because it's got uh, a tall canopy of pine trees. The other one's more open area, so there's a lot more sunlight, and there's not as many trees the bees can fly through, so there's a lot of open areas. And then July 1st, we notice a lot more dragonflies and those purple martins flying around and all them other little sweet birds that eat my bees. <laughs> you you find out in September it uh, you get a better return on them or not? Usually about the first week of September, all the way up into about the last of October, we get a pretty good return on them. Yeah, I was thinking about starting back up again in uh, September. Yeah. Of course, you know another thing too is uh, like those cells I got out there in the incubator. We candle them too, which you know that's putting light through them, and that way you can uh, check. See if she's actually in there moving, and if you just got a dark spot there, and you know you don't have no luck with that bear. I put them up in my ear. Someone told me you put them up the ear, and you could hear them. I don't know who that was, but <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of ways to do it, and some people don't want to put that bee thing in their ear. <laughs> <laughs> it does work, though. It does. It does. I think I only had one, uh, one or maybe two. It didn't. Uh, didn't emerge so they do they do pretty good uh, but uh, you hate to sell someone a queen cell and then it uh, you know it'd be a dud so uh, well that's the whole thing you know people usually buy like if they buy a large order of queen cells we usually give them I like a hundred we'll give them 10 to 15 extra you know 25 we usually give two or three and then we check them with a light we show the customer there's the queen you can see her moving if you don't want it we'll give you a different one so it's like okay. nukes we point the queen out and and tell the customer you don't like it we'll get you a different box and not, not a problem 
Yeah, I had some uh, uh, queens that uh, uh, virgin queens, and I didn't have no place to put them, so I, I released them tonight. So I don't know where I'll have some swarms out there, where dragonflies will eat them, or what. But, uh, you just released your queen? I just released them. I didn't have no boxes made up, nothing to put them in. And you must not watch all my videos I've done. I got to stop making videos. There's too many. There's one called Banking Queens. Yeah, I think I did uh, did watch that one. Yep. See, you forgot it already. Yeah. Right. You can you can <laughs> bank two to three hundred queens in a hive, you know. Yeah, but I, I thought you said they didn't do too good if you banked them. Well, is your odds any better if you banked them than if you just turned them loose? Yeah, well, I got The more. next question well, is how long do you coming. bank I got, them? I got 14 more out there uh, uh, ready to merge in a few more days. So, See, the, the, the thing is, a lot of times people take what I say is that's the only way, but there's always ifs and ands. You know, you're gonna lose and they don't do as good, but let's say we grab that or we have too many queens and we bank 1,000, 1,500 in the fall. Well, yeah, you're gonna be the first one out of the gate, but you're gonna have 5% or it's not gonna be good queens. That's, that's what you're looking at. But if you bank them for say 14 days, you almost got 100% good queens. Yeah, I reject some of them. It's not very long. If they don't, they don't look well. I just reject them. That's being discriminatory. Yeah. That's like saying all short people's no good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen some short queens that filled out really good. So size doesn't mean nothing. Performance. You know, that's, that's how I judge a queen. You know, I sell breeder queens myself, and a breeder queen. I think I showed uh, Greg how to check on them. They go, they'll lay from sidebar to sidebar and top bar to bottom bar. And you won't have an inch of honey band across the top. That is a breeder queen. And if you, know, you raise your own breeder out queens, there in uh, different hives. Well, those they, queens there, mark them, and then you can get 250, 300 for them all day long, no problem. Yeah. And see, I, when I sell breeder queens, I do not sell them through the mail. If you come here, you look at the pattern, you look at the queen, then you buy. I don't ship, and then people say, my queen was no good because once it's in the mail, I don't have no control. They might play football with that box on the truck when they're you know, on their lunch break. So it damaged queens gives you a bad reputation. That's why I like to deal in person with the first. Show them what they got. You're not buying that pig in the poke. Mm -hmm. That builds your reputation up good, too. That was probably a real good way to get uh, good bees down is being a commercial student of yours when it came down, uh, you know, being with the Tom Sawyer uh, program there. When you're when I'm one of your students, I build my own nukes. Yep. Uh, and so what I ended up with was breeder quality queens. Uh, mm -hmm. And it still shows four years later. You know, I, I was just showing a, a guy today, one of these queens, and she's just now starting to just thin out just a little bit, but she is laying up a storm. I've moved her mm -hmm. and, and several of them four times already this year and made this split after split after split. But the fun part is when you're down in your yard putting your own uh, nukes together, is it just, you know, I mean, it's hard to it's hard to to relay the quality of the queens in your boxes there, but when these cells are per, like the cells themselves are just perfectly straight all the way down and from left to right up to down just full of brood. It's it was fun seeing that in your yard, but it's really fun seeing it in my yard, uh, especially year after year and with all the daughter queens. How those some of those traits just continue to express themselves is uh, it's pretty neat. It's hard to teach somebody, you know, online how to do something uh, in a book. I mean, sure, you know, you come here, you're going to work your bees yourself. So I want to watch you work bees here. That way I can help you. It's not free labor. It's basically I catch things that you're doing automatically. I spot them. I can sit. 
15, 20 feet away. I spot your mistakes and I let yeah. you know how to correct them. That makes good beekeepers. It's not being criticized enough by anybody. That's the truth there. Uh, let's see, Mr. Brett, Pointer Bee Farm. Go ahead, buddy. Y'all have to unmute yourself there. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, I noticed on this graph that I have right now in the starter finisher, they're starting to build comb between the cells. Mm -hmm. Can I just cut alongside those cells to get them when I have to get them out? You can. Uh, you should have cells that don't have comb between them. I do, but there's a few of them that have cell, you know, they're attaching them together basically. How close are you putting them? Finger apart? Uh, a little over a finger. And that might be your problem. When you was down here, we was grafting. How many we put on a cell? A bar? Uh, fifteen or so. Yeah. So you, you basically you put your finger between each one. If you extend it over any further, then you're going to get some burr comb. But is the best way to just to cut that right in half? You can. What if they built down below where she would be emerging from? If you build your base up like we do down there. You slide your knife down the whole bar and you take off 15 at one whack. Yep. You know, I mean, I guess it's like walking, you know, I have to stop and think about each step because I just do it automatically. Get you a dull uh, butter knife. Uh, that works the best. Don't okay. use a sharp knife when you're pulling queen's uh, cells off. It okay. digs into the wood. Have you had the wood get dug into? Not yet. Okay. You might be getting your base high enough then. Yeah, it's pretty thick. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Mr. Mark, I see you've got a live internet connection there. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah sorry about that, guys. I, my internet was wacky a minute ago. Um, but I'm, I just gonna stay on topic. I've seen some of the videos on grafting. I haven't actually tried it. Um, but I just, can you, can you help me understand a little more once you, I, I understand how you've built the frames and you're grafting the cells um, to start making queens. But once you have your frame made up, are you just drop? How, where are you you dropping that into one of your five frame hives and, and just letting it rip? And then I also heard you talk about you have an incubator. Can you just help me understand that a little more, please? If you're grafting commercially, you know, you're not doing one or two bars, you're doing, you know, 100 at a, at a shot. So we don't do what you call starter finishers. We put them in queenless hives, which are starters, and we add bees to them constantly. And as soon as the cells are capped, they go into an incubator, which we convert old fridge rate. Um, okay, okay, that makes sense. The, riding the bicycle with a tricycle. If you're getting into grafting, and if you haven't been in the bees two to three years, cut cells is going to be your best bet, and it's easier to understand. Okay. Thanks, Don. Okay. Yeah, I think Don cutting cells was probably one of the most amazing insurance policies uh, that you ever teach. Just like uh, Brett and I were talking earlier this week on the, on the uh, Fat Bee Man group, same thing happened to Brett, happened to me, and it's happened before, uh, and I keep telling myself there's an easy solution to it, but uh, had a nice nice starter. You know, there was 50-ish cap cells, beautiful. A guy came, bought nukes, so I got tied up, put, put everything back, got his nukes taken care of, you know, got to talking like most of his beekeepers do, got sidetracked, uh, never actually put those cells in the splits that I had made, uh, and then I came back, I was going to do it uh, the next day. Well, a little bit of time passed on, uh, maybe three days or so. And I know the day they were capped. I know the day we grafted them. And sure enough, I went to finally get out there and move those cells. And every single one of them was all torn down. And here is a big, fat, husky, plump queen that had been laying for three days. So what had happened is a, a virgin had, it must have already, I flew out of, we went on a mating flight, came back went in that box and they tore everybody down. Uh, and that's just, you know, you know, 50 bucks or 50 Queens at 40 bucks, do the math. Uh, you would think it would be smart enough to, you know, so I, I know, I know you don't use those goofy little uh, entrance dials, but I, I like them myself 
and there's an easy solution for that is I just, if I turn that, I would think, turn that to the queen excluder setting, that ought to help for the most part, uh, the wrong queen getting in the wrong box. Uh, and then I can go in there and get my cells out, but uh, it, it keeps, it's been a problem on more than one occasion. So I'm gonna have to do a little better job on that. But so what happened is, you know, I'd already made all the splits. I already had the bees, honey, they were already ready to go. They just needed a queen cell. Uh, and so luckily uh, resource hives are important, but I think you have to kind of bunch having hives that are already crowded out with cells that's that needs to be a part i think of your resource portfolio uh and because of another trick we learned from you know, on marking the lids i knew exactly where i had queen cells so i went right in and made uh, a withdrawal from that from that savings account of them queen cells cut them all out uh and got real close to getting what i needed there so learning how to cut cells using wax has been tremendous and if you're down, if you're down south, uh, in the citrus areas, man, this little citrus knives, they're, they're, they're serrated. Uh, they're not sharp, but you can really, and they have a little bit, you really, really can't see it here, but there's a slight little hook in that thing. Boy, that thing is real handy cutting cells. And especially if you're using any foundation with vertical wire, you can come right in behind there and just flay right on that wire. Um, it's, it's handy. So find you, if you're going to look into, to get into cutting cells, find you whatever knife, a paring knife, a Don talks about something that you're comfortable with. Uh, it's, if I hadn't learned that trick from Don, you know, what would I have done? I would have wasted, those bees would have sat there until I would have had to dig through hives and grab fresh, you know, two day old brood and throw that in there. It would have been chasing your tail, it seems like. Well, you know, another thing too, when you have uh, 40 or 50 cells in there and you, you get, busy on something else, uh, you're doing queens on a small scale. You can afford to do queen cell protectors. You could buy the orange protectors and they stand up. You can build a block yourself, set the cell mm. protector there, drop a, a, a drop of honey in there with an eyedropper, stand your cell up, whether it's a cut cell or a grafted cell. That way, the base of the queen cell will keep the queen from coming out. She comes out the bottom and there's enough room in that cell protector, she can almost do a U-turn. Uh, there's enough in there to, to last for a day or two. I mean, to me, doing 50 queen cells is backyard, small cell, you know, small time beaky. But when we start doing a thousand cells at a time, you don't want to lose them. So we have to watch our time really close to even our refrigerator. You got 500 cells coming out. If you're six hours off, and weapons and themselves for money. You lost your money. And so you, you're going down and you pull 500 queens from your yard. You go back the first thing in the morning and here you go pick up your cells and the, one of them got out and cut them all down. It's just, that's why it's so important to, to get them all the right age to find things out for at least 24 hours. Later on, you can get them within a few hours. I mean, I basically, I done a timing box, and I explained the timing box. You can get up on the time, but if you get, you get coming out within, you know, you get several hundred to come out within two hours by getting the right graph and the right recording pattern. It's so practice to ride a bicycle. Nobody gets on a bicycle and it's perfect. They fall a few times. They make a few mistakes, a few bruises, and then they stay pretty good. Once you get good, you can almost stand still on that bike. <laughs> well, I think you got, you got to skin your knee a couple times to appreciate riding with no hands, you know, doing tricks. That's just, that's all part of it, you know. Yep. But uh, we've got just a, a few minutes uh, left, Don. I don't see any, uh, any more questions. I think a lot of folks in the Midwest, uh, the East Coast, depending on how much rain you've gotten, we're probably, a lot of folks are getting close to being in a, in a Darth. I noticed the last two days, uh, all of a sudden I've got clouds of bees in the workshop feeding on an old sugar barrel that hadn't had sugar in it for probably about a month. Um, and so it, well, it was about time to, to get, get them fed again. Uh, wanted to throw it out there. Uh, and the same thing for you, Don, if, you're, if anyone's using those feeder plugs that we sell, 
uh, or those one gallon pails that we get from industrial container, uh, we used to use those gasket seal lids. Uh, well, they have been out of stock for almost three months now. Um, and so a lot of people are looking to build the feeders, but are stopping because they can't find the right lid. Well, I went ahead and bought a few hundred of the, these regular lids here, which they don't have the rubber gasket. They're just the, a, a standard bucket lid. Uh, but we put a bunch of those on. They've been out in the sun and they're not leaking yet at all. So I'm gonna keep my eye on there and make sure that they don't. But if you, if you can listen, they, they snap in real tight uh, and they're just as thick as the other one. So uh, it's a hair early to say they're gonna work just as good, but so far they've been in 92 degrees uh, and they're not leaking. So uh, that might be an option there. If you are looking to build those bucket feeders, um, getting those lids where you can uh, that might that might be a deal breaker. It might that might help you out there. Yeah, time is money in those bee yards, so you know, it's like uh, I've had people come here. I got stacks of feeders out there, and I I tell them, you know, we used to sell these things. We used to build them for thirty five dollars. You want to buy a bunch of them? Well, why don't you use them? What's wrong with them? Nothing. They don't understand. You set a hundred boxes out. By the time you lift one lid up. To fill that container, you're down the row with 25 buckets already. I mean, yeah. we go down with three buckets in, in each hand, knocking the empty buckets off, flipping the new bucket over the, the syrup, and then we have another student that we go back to the truck and drop those buckets, and then they're filling them up. It's time management. I mean, it's going to cost you a little bit for that bucket, but by the time you play around, build a feeder. The feeders are absolutely good for somebody who's got up to about maybe 20, 25 hives. Excellent feeder. They don't drown bees. They work perfect. I mean, for out yards, they're good for a week to 10 days. Uh, there's a lot of good pluses, but when you start getting what you call a few hundred hives, seconds here, seconds there add up to a lot of time. It's, people look at you like you're crazy. You talk about, well, I save a second on this, two seconds on that. Well, what's well, no big deal. <laughs> but it's it's the way things are in a commercial yard. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dennis, go ahead, Dennis. You have to unmute yourself there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. I just thought of something. I've seen times running out. I uh, made the first batch of Ross rounds, and boy, they look good. And I'm not into dearth yet. We've had, we've been real fortunate. My problem is trying to keep the hives from being honey bound. Mm -hmm. Would it be better off for me to put honey on top feeder in the dearth than it would be without a dearth? Wait until they need it. Would they draw it down and make Ross rounds quicker? Well, I've done videos on that, and I even went through that whole process with Paul. Uh, like goldenrod, people say it tastes terrible and everything. We build up a nuke with two uh, Ross rounds on top of it with a bucket feeder with pure honey. They'll draw that bottom out and make a lot of brood, and they'll seal off two beautiful white uh, supers of Ross rounds. But what you need to pay attention to is do not smoke them bees when you're pulling Ross rounds because we had uh, one, one or two supers that were smoked a little bit, and the customers said it tasted like barbecue honey. So I, I use very little smoke, but somebody else had pulled the supers off, and they used a little too much smoke, and the wax, it just absorbs that smell. If anything, I would pull your supers, whether they're completely sealed off altogether, stack them up, and put a one-way entrance reducer on top of it with a bottom with a bottom sealed off you know set on a lid sealed lid and then a lid on top of that entrance reducer that's what them oval holes are for that's the only reason we would use a inner cover for a bee escape uh, i don't like to use vigo or those chemicals i like to let the bees come out naturally uh, smoke on uh, that that cuts a, a premium honey down to half we have customers that will buy that stuff sight unseen, twelve fifty a ring. So you can buy goldenrod honey for about a dollar ten a pound, and you buy two five gallon buckets, 
you can turn one nuke to 175 for the bottom and 250 for each super. So you're taking a, basically a dollar investment and turn it into a $25 return. I was just curious if it'd be more advantage to wait for a dearth, they'd be more apt to draw it down or I'm well, I've got a honey flow right now still going pretty good or just go on and put it on, let them decide. If they'll pull what they need and if they need it, they'll mix it. It ain't going to hurt nothing. You know, okay. Be calm. Well, I've, this year they're begging for comb. Yep. That's and I like to take care of that. The ground is you want to get them sealed as soon as possible and preferably use an upper entrance because the less tracking on those hot, those uh, wax uh, cappings, the better they resell. Yeah. If you let them sit too long after they're capped, they get tracking. They start getting that yellow look to them. You want them snow white. Okay. They look that way now. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, Don, judging by the clock over your right shoulder there, we're here over 9 o'clock. Do you have any uh, final thoughts or anything else you want to say before we cut loose? Well, everybody wants to stay after the after chat. They can talk about me then. And then <laughs> get your questions. I mean, I'm surprised more people this time of the year hasn't come up with some questions. And that's the whole point of doing these chats, so we can exchange information and make you a better beekeeper, hopefully. If not, no questions. We'll see you in two weeks. So appreciate Greg uh, taking over here and running the whole show here, keeping everything up for us. We'll All right, see guys. You in two weeks. Thanks, right. Greg. Thanks, Thanks Don. Thank you. Good night.